Greetings and welcome to our viewers. I'm very delighted to welcome Father Louis Logan, the Superior General. Thank you, Father, for being with us this day. Thank you for the invitation. It's a real joy. In 2010, I was a scholastic at the International Scholastic Aid in Rome. I had the privilege of participating in the 35th General Chapter of the Missionary Oblates of Mary Immaculate. I participated as an auxiliary staff member. On the 28th of September 2010, if my memory serves me well, it was the 58th birthday, Father Louis. That same day, you were chosen as the 13th Superior General of the Missionary Oblates of Mary Immaculate. A very emotional moment. I remember very well those words, with fear and trembling, I accept. The entire room exclaimed with great joy and jubilation. It's been 12 years already. How has your journey been? How has it enriched your Oblate life? Mm. That's, a, that's a challenging question. I'd like to go back to what you remember, however. Uh, it's true, I said, uh, I accept with fear and trembling. And then I said, with the grace of God and the help of my brothers. And you also said, uh, I'm the 13th uh, successor, a 13th superior general. And did, I don't know if you remember what Father Steckling said that day. He said, uh, I introduced to you, Father Louis Logan, the 12th superior general after our founder, St. Eugene. I think he didn't want to say the 13th. That, that would be bad luck in some cultures. <laughs> so the 12th after the founder. <laughs> so the journey, how has the journey been? Uh, the word I, I like to say as I reflected on this uh, these years is that it stretched me. I have been stretched in many different ways. Um, getting to know the congregation, in 70 countries, we have the beautiful tree here behind us. Knowing the oblates, doing all kinds of work from, from the base with the poorest, in the heart of cities, uh, huge cities like Mexico City, Hong Kong, um, uh, Johannesburg, uh, often places that are violent, and then in universities, in the academia, in the centers of learning, we are, we are really missionaries for all needs, all urgent needs of the church. So I felt very much stretched. Also, I've seen so many wonderful things, uh, beginning with the people, the people who are often suffering, often living in fear, living in, in hunger, living in uh, drastic climatic conditions from the Arctic Circle to the deserts, and to know, to be in touch with the faith of the people has been a beautiful, a beautiful thing. The resilience of the people to um, believe in God close to them in the midst of so much suffering. And also, not only to believe, but to have joy. I saw in many places the, um, the, the simple joy of people who come together. They have tea and biscuits in sharing a real joyful evangelical spirit. So the journey has stretched me. Also the contact with the church, seeing how the church is alive around the world in, in many different ways. The, the church of uh, Eastern Europe, the church of Asia and Africa growing so much, the church in Australia or Europe, the United States, where we see diminishment and many, many challenges. Uh, and the oblates are there in all these realities, faithful, struggling with the people to bring the gospel, and, and filled with hope. So I have been stretched by this experience, and I have found it to be a very hope-filled and life-giving. Yeah. What were the main aspects of your mandate? First of all, just as we're doing here, the general chapter gave us directions, not only one direction, but many directions. And that is, uh, the, the chapter, as we know, is the highest authority in the congregation. And so what the chapter gave us was myself with the council, that was our work. And I, I have to say um, that the, 
the general council, the central government working together embraced uh, this, main, this main work, this main mission. We worked together. We had each meeting a planning document, which was uh, coming off of the general chapter calls, and we would see what we have done, what we haven't done yet. And we followed that until June of this year. Uh, 90, 90 to 100 pages of what we have done in light of the chapter and what is yet to be done. So establishing the commission on mission with youth, for example, or establishing the general mission committee, following up on uh, communications, social communications, following up on formation, oh, so many aspects of formation. So all those were our main, our main work. We had to carry out what the, the 36th general chapter told us to do. That was our mandate. Mm -hmm. Along with that, then, there's governance, administration, and animation that we had to do. That I say we, you know, together with the council. Yeah. I'm sure there were joyful memories and many challenging moments, too. Uh, please share with us some life-giving moments and some challenges you encountered along the journey. How did you overcome these? Okay, the, the life-giving moments are many. Uh, I would say, first of all, visiting the, uh, the missions around the world for me and for the members of the General Council was always uh, an opportunity to be with the Oblates, see their work, meet the people. And that uh, was very life-giving for the Oblates. At first, I didn't realize what a visit from myself or a general counselor, assistant general, vicar general, meant to the men in the mission and, and on, the, on the base. But it really is a, a joyful fraternal moment. And I had many wonderful experiences. Uh, seeing in Sri Lanka, the young men came out dancing to welcome me. In India, the same thing. In Mexico, a whole procession with flowers to welcome me. Each culture has a, a beauty to it, and, and that was wonderful uh, and joyful to see. Uh, the year of Oblate vocations brought me great uh, joy to see. First of all, we had the Congress before the two, 2016 chapter, but then we had the vocational year. And many units really reignited their um, fervor for vocation ministry. So that was a, a, appointing the director for the justice, peace, and integrity of creation was also a great realization and joy. We searched for four years, and finally we found Father Jean Eric, and he is the director now. That was a great uh, sense of joy. We had the second OLEC, Oblate Lay Associations Congress, in the end of May, you know how beautiful that was. And it was an explosion of energy, of affection for the congregation and the mutual life-giving presence of uh, the lay oblates with the bowed oblates. That was a tremendous moment. I also had the privilege of going to Laos in 2016, December, for the beatification of the Laotian martyrs, among whom are six Oblates of Mary Immaculate, and we know Blessed Mario Borzaga is among them. Uh, I also participated in the beatification of the Spanish martyrs, but that was 2011. That was 12 years ago, 11, 10 years ago. So there's been many, many um, joy-filled moments to see, for example, the seminar we had on the Oblate Charism was a very life-giving moment for the congregation. And then there was the seminar also on oblation in martyrdom in Pozuelo in 2019, I think. Uh, so many, many of the ordinations, the final vows that I've been able to witness around the congregation have been wonderful, uh, joy-filled, life-giving moments. I must also mention Aix-en-Provence. I think, I think you were there for a few days, huh? Yeah. Yes, a few days. <laughs> the establishment of that house, uh, the renovation of the house, but the establishment of the community and the ministry that you and the Oblates and X are doing is a real 
a real gift for the congregation. So there's many joys. I don't know if I should move on to challenges now. Yeah. The challenges are many. I would say, first of all, that our congregation really be um, committed to the safeguarding uh, of children and vulnerable adults. That is a worldwide challenge. And we have to be committed to make our, our homes, our residences, and our ministries, everything that we do, uh, safe for children and vulnerable adults. And I urge uh, in the chapter, also the last chapter, this chapter, we have spoken about that. Connected to that is the challenge we met in Canada that many oblates already know, many people in the world know. The, the, our presence in 48 Indian residential schools is not uh, seen as a positive element for the, for the native peoples, the indigenous peoples. And now we are seeking paths for reconciliation, for forgiveness, and for a new moment where we can move on. But uh, the indigenous people, you know, said, we cannot move on this too quickly. When they came to see the Pope at the end of March, they also uh, wanted to see me, the Inuit, the First Nations, and the Métis. So we have a challenge there to, how could I say, heal some of our history of evangelization. Other challenges are, let's say, it always comes up is formation. How can we better prepare our young men, and we're blessed to have many young men joining us, how can we prepare them for mission today? The world is changing so quickly, youth are changing, and uh, how do we bring the gospel to them? How do we invite young men to join us and then prepare them to be missionaries? We are more and more sending missionaries to other countries, internationality. And with that comes how to enter another culture respectfully. How should uh, a, an oblate community receive someone who comes from outside, uh, from another country? How should we prepare to receive them? Those are big questions that we're, we're looking at. And then there's the question of ongoing formation. It came up here in the, in the chapter, in the last chapter, to have a lifelong growth in spirituality, in our missionary uh, awareness, in our psychology, our own affectivity, how to continue to grow. So this is another uh, challenge we have. The, a great challenge is to respond to the, the founder's call that we, we respond to the urgent needs of the poor today. And I think we have to continually discern, are we really with the poor or have we settled? Father Steckling asked that, I think a very hard question at the chapter in 2010. Uh, are we doing by routine what we've always done? Or are we really moving, you know, to, to, a, to respond to the needs of the poor? That is a big, big challenge. Another challenge, and I'll say this is the last one, would be the vocational challenge. To continue, I said we had the vocational year. It was a wonderful year. But so often I hear, um, oh, there are no vocations here. This society is secularized. The youth today no longer go to church. You know, I don't accept that. What we're saying then is God does not call anyone today. Are we men of faith or are we secularized too? We say, oh yeah, we don't believe God calls anybody. So we are involved in our pastoral work and we don't do any vocational work. And then we say, see, there are no vocations. It's Father Ron Rollheiser always says, it's a self-fulfilling death wish. Just a few, two months ago, an oblate came up to me and said, you know, we're dying. We have no future. Well, you know, I've heard that too. It's a, it's a, a little chant, a little, you know, people repeat, but it doesn't come from a perspective of faith, I think. That's my opinion. If we allow ourselves to die, okay, I mean, if we choose that, if we do nothing about inviting new people. And 
it's not only inviting young people to know us and to consider a vocation, but our lives have to show something. Our lives have to show fraternity, joy, commitment to the poor, a life of prayer. Then we will attract. I'm not talking about numbers. Numbers doesn't matter, don't matter. But um, I'm talking about uh, uh, a life that radiates the gospel in the spirit of St. Eugene, community, prayer, closeness to the poor, that will attract young people. So vocations and believing, Oblate's believing in our future is a challenge. During your term as Superior General of the Congregation, we celebrated some milestone like the 200th uh, anniversary of the foundation of the congregation in 2016. Over and over again, you referred to these moments as moments of grace and rebirth for the congregation. You have challenged the congregation, making us aware or reminding us uh, that we have three choices before us, stagnation, death, or rebirth. As you come to the end of your term, What's the future looks like for our beloved family? That's a difficult question. In a sense, I think we're in all three places. I was thinking of a tree, a beautiful tree, maybe this tree right here. Sometimes you have to prune it. There's a dead branch or a branch that's hanging out too far and it has to be cut off. And then new life springs up. So I think in parts of the congregation, there is a sense of death. In other parts of the congregation, there could be inertia and stagnation. And in other parts of the congregation, I would say a greater part, there's vitality and revitalization. And this is the invitation I have made through the chapter report that I gave. Um, I believe we're invited to revitalize the whole tree. But at the same time, the tree as an organic, um, as a living organism, there is continuous uh, life and death going on. We, I believe, as I said, two thirds, a great part of the congregation is full of life. When I talk to the uh, young oblates in formation, just out of formation, oblates like you, uh, like Father Sean Hill, I see immense energy, hope, vision for the future. I see men who are praying, who are living in community, who want um, uh, the mission to be really close to the poor, the, to respond to the urgent needs of the church. That is what we need and that is as i said previously what will draw others to join us the uh, mediterranean province had a mission around father giovanni santolini he, who, who died about 25 years ago in the congo an italian missionary they did a, a tremendous beautiful wonderful mission in genova with oblate priests brothers scholastics lay oblates, uh, the, the Missionary Association, the MGC, the young lay people. It was a real um, explosion of energy and faith in Genova. And the, the bishop was involved, diocesan priests, a beautiful, beautiful mission. That's that attraction I was speaking of. And that's where I see so many of our young people are really desirous of this kind of a congregation. We also have elders, older oblates, who have, I think, the real spirit of St. Eugene and are encouraging the young people through instruction in the charism, through sharing life with them in the same vision. I have, for this reason, for these reasons, tremendous hope that we're on the way to revitalization. Uh, the interest we have in the charism of the founder, you know, the interest we have in improving our community life, the desire we have to be men of prayer, these are all good signs of the spirit that we are, we will not remain in stagnation and go toward death, but we will journey towards 
uh, revitalization, renewal, refounding. Good. Pilgrims of Hope in Communion is the theme of our general chapter. How is this chapter responding to the call of the Spirit? Uh, first of all, I'd say the theme, Pilgrims of Hope in Communion, has captivated the assembly of the chapter. Over and over, we discover new meanings to that phrase. Uh, beautiful meaning, meanings, challenging meaning, meanings, and it's really um, powerful, very powerful. How are we responding? I would say we are responding, we are beginning, I would say the response is like action, but we are welcoming the theme, we are welcoming the, the call of the Spirit, we are in that in-between place, hearing and doing. We're listening to the Spirit's voice in each other, in the voice of the poor through our, our ministries that we, we bring here, the voice of the lay associates that spoke to us. Uh, all these voices, we hear the Spirit calling us to live as people on a journey, to live with hope in our hearts and to move toward communion. Uh, this coming week, we will probably, we will certainly hammer out concrete responses to what we're hearing the Spirit call us to. And it is calling us, no, it's no surprise, but calling us to embrace again the charism of St. Eugene de Mazenod. What is next? What is Probably next? Logan what is next? <laughs> you know, I'll have a dialogue with the next Superior General, and uh, I'll be happy to go anywhere he sends me, I think. <laughs> I, uh, I would like to go to a mission with the poor, you know. Uh, after so many years, 18 years of administration, you know, as provincial in the States, and then here 12 years. So I would be happy to go back to work with the people, the poor someplace. But, you know, I'm open to whatever I'm needed for. I will stay for a while in Rome a couple weeks for a transition period between the, the old administration, helping the new understand what's been going on in the congregation. And then I'll go to the States for some health checkups. I thank everybody for the prayers for me during my sickness. And I feel very well, but I haven't been to a checkup for uh, like a year and a half, so I'll go to the doctors, the dentists, and then probably spend Thanksgiving, which is a special uh, feast for people from the United States, and Christmas with my family in the area of Buffalo, New York. So those that's the immediate. We have here with us um, a very important relic of uh, Saint Eugene de Maisonot, uh, a very essential part of his of his life as a human being, but as a saint as well. That's his heart, and as we know, he was a man uh, known with, as, as a man with a big heart to embrace uh, the whole world. And Father Louis, the charism has embraced the whole world. Uh, That's as, true. As we have referred to the tree um, that Saint Eugene here with us, and his spirit is very much alive among us. Uh, you have experienced that in the congregation over these past few years. What would you like to say to our viewers as you as your term comes to an end? What message would you like to communicate? deep from your heart, or should we say deep from the heart of the founder, as <laughs> you've been his successor. Well, thank you for this opportunity. I think there's a few messages, if I may. One is uh, gratitude. Gratitude to my brother Oblates on the central government, the council, the treasurer general, the secretary general, all the Oblates in the general administration here in Rome. Uh, you have worked faithfully, constantly, fraternally. So thank you so much. I, I thank all the oblates of the congregation for your faithfulness in mission, the elder oblates in houses around the world who pray for us, who sustain the congregation by your oblation day after day. I thank the young oblates who are coming to us, joining us and pray for you and ask you to be persevering in your vocation. I think the oblate uh, lay people around the world, our associates 
in so many different ways we have associates. And wherever I, I have gone, they have welcomed me with immense uh, cariño, with immense affection. When I was first elected here in uh, Rome uh, 12 years ago, I can remember the AMI, the Missionary Association of Mary Immaculate, the Italian lay associates, welcomed me so warmly, and the COMI and the OMI, so many groups here in Italy and around the world. So thank you for that uh, very much. I'm full of gratitude. And I, my, my final word would be Ephesians 3, 19. I was in India on a dark day, and we were at Mass, and a young junior, a young philosopher, he stood up to read the gospel, the uh, first reading from Ephesians, and the, the sunlight came in through the window and fell on him. And I said, oh my goodness, I think God has a message for me. And he read that passage, which we hear every two years, but we also hear in the office uh, vespers every month. And it is the spirit at work in us, among us, the spirit moving among us, will do infinitely more, infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Word of God. In, not a little bit more, infinitely more. And that takes me to the wedding feast of Cana, abundance of wine, the best wine, the five loaves and two fishes, an abundance of food. It's Moses hitting the rock and water gushing forth. Sometimes we're like not expecting much from God. I think of Sarah laughing when the angels told her she was gonna conceive a child and she kind of laughed. Sometimes we're like that. We don't really believe it'll happen. And this, uh, passage from Ephesians, it captivates me. And that's given me hope in, in dark moments. The Spirit is among us. Even where, you know, sometimes in, in Europe or North America, we see empty churches. Nobody's going to church. The Spirit is in the heart of society, in the heart of the world, and is moving around, is moving around. And, and people are catching the Spirit. And we'll, the Spirit will do infinitely more that we can hope, we can imagine or ask for. So that is uh, my, my word to all of you. Thank you. And let us believe the Spirit is doing infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. God bless you and thank you. Thank you very much for this time together. Thank you very much, Father Louis, for, for first of all making time for your availability and for serving us as operators of Mary Immaculate and for your leadership uh, during these past 12 years. You've been a blessing to many of us, you've been a blessing to the congregation. Um, it's sad to see you leave, but we know that you're still with us. We, you're mm -hmm. still our brother, and we are your brothers as well. We journey together. Uh, so whatever awaits you, we pray for you, we keep you in our prayers, and we keep wonderful memories of your leadership in our hearts. Thank you for everything you've been uh, to us as a family. You've mm -hmm. been a father. And for that, we are truly, truly grateful. May God bless you. Amen. Amen. Thank You're you. most welcome.